Hey everybody, I'm Jason. This is Jay's Project Garage. So this is the next video, and we're gonna talk about emissions, because that's everybody's favorite subject. I'm not the end-all be-all, and I don't know everything, but this is, what my, this is how my pea brain understands it. So in the infancy of emission systems, they used what was called an air pump. It looks like this. They would pull in air through the charcoal canister, except originally they didn't use a charcoal canister. I think that came around in the mid early 70s. Um, it would just pull, the original ones would just pull air from the atmosphere. Later on, they would route it through the charcoal canister to help pull some of those vapors because uh, fuel caps weren't vented anymore. So they would have to still have to vent the fuel tank and the, the fuel vapors would go through the charcoal canister before they went to the atmosphere. But the uh, air pump would pull from the charcoal canister also so it was getting some of those fuel vapors and re-injecting it into the engine. And it would push it into the engine Um, mid 60s is when they first started it. Mid to late 60s is when it really started getting a whole uh, catch and hold. They were using PCV valves, getting rid of the road draft tubes so they had less emissions going out right onto the pavement. And they were using air pumps and they were injecting the air as close to the exhaust valve as they could when the exhaust was still hot. And this is what an air injection tube from a 428 Cobra jet looks like. And they were also messing around with uh, heated base, base plates and uh, exhaust crossovers and exhaust crossovers in the intake manifold right underneath the carburetor pad to try to heat up the intake as quickly as they could because the engine is least efficient when it's cold. An engine operates best once at operating temperature, right? And we'll talk about that more when it comes to the EGR, EGR system here in just a few minutes. But I'm going to get just a little bit into how an engine works, and then we'll cover it more when I get to the piston flip thing. The reason engines aren't as efficient as they possibly can be is because this is gasoline. Nitromethane and oxygenated fuels are a little bit different. They are engineered to burn. They supply their own oxygen and they actually completely burn during the combustion cycle. And we'll talk about how, how it burns and when it burns and all that kind of stuff in the next video. The OEs knew that a long time ago is that the reason they weren't burning all the fuel is because they were running out of oxygen. So right after the exhaust valve, they would inject air into the hot exhaust stream and it would reignite the mixture to burn it more before it exited out the tailpipe. Does that make sense? Now in the last video, I talked about uh, getting the exhaust out, not wanting any more exhaust inside the combustion chamber than you absolutely had to because it would make the engine less efficient in high performance applications. But emissions are a little bit different. Yes, they're taking efficiency into, into account or into consideration, but they're also concentrating on what's going out the tailpipe. And it's referred to as NOx emissions. So the gist of it is, and how it works, is the EGR valve will allow ox or oxygen, not oxygen, and it, or inert gas back into the combustion chamber to cool. This seems counterproductive, but it will actually cool the combustion process to lower emissions. Now, if it's confusing, don't feel left alone because there's. I have a hard time wrapping my head around it because I have always 
been of the high performance school, not of the lower emission school. Let's look to some EGR valves and I'll explain more on how they work. Okay, so for everybody else following along, this video is for Gene Bodish. Hopefully I said your name right. If I didn't, I'm sorry. Is He's working on a 94 Mercury Villager and he's having an issue with the EGR solenoid. Is that right? So basically, how an EGR valve works and when it doesn't work. It doesn't work at idle and it doesn't work at hard throttle or high load. And it, the old ones regulated off the amount of vacuum and where the port was in the carburetor. So at idle, it's not seeing vacuum. And at hard throttle, when the vacuum moves down in the carburetor, it loses a vacuum signal and closes the valve. So it won't allow EGR gases into the engine because in that application, you want all out power. Emissions come second. There's safety reasons. There's all kinds of stuff why manufacturers do that. You're merging into traffic. There's a freaking semi coming. When you stomp on it, you want the thing to go. You're not worried about what's coming out the tailpipe. You just need to go. It can cause an accident. That's part of the reason why they do it. Okay, so when the engine warms up, the, the early EGR systems would use a temperature gauge or a temperature sensor. It's actually not even a sensor. It sort of is, but it's a temperature switch. It will be in the coolant. When the engine reaches temperature, you have one vacuum line that goes in the top of the switch and one that comes out the bottom and goes to the EGR valve. And it may go other places and do other things, but that's this is the simplified version. It'll come from the carburetor into the switch, come out of the switch and go to the EGR valve. When the engine's up to temperature, that switch will open and it'll allow vacuum to go to the EGR valve and it'll, exact, it'll work exactly the way I explained before. Um, off idle and under normal driving conditions when you're not hard on the gas that EGR valve is allowing exhaust gases to go back into the combustion chamber to cool the, ex the combustion process and it lowers NOx emissions. As time went on they started adding more things to that. They get away from the the coolant switch and they would start putting sensors in the exhaust and would measure exhaust temperature and that's how it would decide when to start using the EGR system. And then systems started getting smarter where it was using the computer to regulate everything. It would use the, uh, a exhaust sensor to measure exhaust temperature it would really relay that information back to the computer. The computer would use a vacuum switch to allow vacuum to the EGR valve, and it would regulate it all while watching what's going on with the O2 sensors in the exhaust. And they can regulate the amount of fuel, and they can regulate how, how much and when the EGR system is functioning. This stuff's actually gotten pretty damn smart. And then over the course of time, it evolved even more and it started getting away from vacuum and started using electric EGR valves. Now in the 94 Mercury Villager, it's still all vacuum operated. And the problem he's running into is triggering a check engine light. And it's saying, I believe, uh, input temperature, but it all goes back to that exhaust temperature sensor. I think that's the, the part of the system that isn't functioning the way it's supposed to be. Now he and I talked back and forth a little bit in the comments and it seems like he may be overcomplicating a really simple system. He was asking about a Venturi effect and all kinds of other stuff and that it really doesn't apply. It's actually a really, really si simple system when you look at it and understand how it functions. Now we'll go back and we'll look at some EGR valves.
Okay, this is an old style EGR valve. You see it's got a vacuum line that comes out and it's gonna to go to that temperature sensor right there. And it's gonna measure coolant temperature and at a certain given point, it's gonna open that switch and it's gonna allow vacuum to come from the carburetor through the switch into the EGR valve. And the way we used to test these things was really easy. With engine idling, you just pull up on the diaphragm. If the engine died, then you knew the valve itself was okay and you start testing other things in the system. You start testing for vacuum and that kind of stuff. This is an evolution. This is another step in the EGR valve. This one still uses a vacuum reference, but the EGR valve itself is just basically a, a solenoid. And the new ones are 100% electronic. They don't use a vacuum signal or anything, but it's the computer can measure all that stuff from the other sensors that are on the engine. Now on, on his, it's, a, it's actually a really sim simple system. The solenoid that activates the EGR valve is, is a 12 volts. Now the computer may change that voltage to change where the solenoid is open and how much the EGR valve is actually doing. My guess is it's off or on. Um, <laughs> this is a hard subject to cover. I'm trying to wrap my head around it. But basically, it's going to use exhaust gas temperature to tell the computer to help it regulate the EGR valve. And it uses a lot of other things also. It's going to use uh, the O2 sensors in the exhaust to measure what's going on there. Uh, but basically, the system is, is super simple. When the engine gets up to temperature, the computer will open the 12-volt switch and allow the EGR valve to operate as long as the temperature sensor is within a certain range in the exhaust. Too low, it's not going to allow the valve to operate. Too high, it's not going to allow the valve to operate. My guess is when it's too high, it's going to add fuel or it's going to look at the engine temperature overall. It may go into limp mode. That's stuff for other, for other videos. But testing the this, this system on that one would be really, really easy. And I did a little bit of reading on that, that particular model, and the EGR valves themselves are built very, very well. They don't normally run into a problem. The solenoid, the vacuum, vacuum solenoid for the EGR valve is also well built. All it is is a 12-volt solenoid. It's open and closing a valve to allow a vacuum to go to the EGR. The most common problem with those is the, that exhaust temperature sensor because it'll wind up getting full of coated with crud. And that crud will act like, act like an insulator and it won't allow that sensor to get an accurate reading on what the ex actual exhaust temperature is. My guess is, if you change that exhaust temperature sensor, the system will function the way it's supposed to. My guess. So take Venturi effect and all the other stuff out of the equation. And like I said, my research, the most common fault with those is that exhaust temperature sensor. So hopefully that's of some help. Uh, when I run into situations like that, if I've narrowed it down and I'm 99.9% .9 sure I know exactly what the problem is, the solenoid is easy, easily testable with 12 volts. You hit it with 12 volts, you see if it operates. Uh, I'm not sure if the diaphragm on the EGR valve on those is exposed, but you can do it the same way we used to, where you just reach in, you grab a hold of it, and you pull up on the diaphragm, and if the engine tries to die at idle, the valve's working. You can hook up a vacuum pump to the EGR valve, give it one of these at idle and see if the engine tries to die. The valve is functioning the way it's supposed to. You can hit the solenoid with 12 volts and do the vacuum pump thing and see if the engine tries to die. Then you know the solenoid's operating correctly. But if I narrow it down and I'm 99.9% .9 sure that I know what the problem is, then I just replace the part. And I'm 99% sure that all that it is is that temperature sensor and all your problems will be solved. So I uh, saw so prices ranging from 25 bucks to 50 bucks.
but that Mercury Villager is the exact same as the Nissan Quest. Ford manufactured that van for Nissan. So you may have some luck finding that part, thinking outside the box and not ordering it for a Villager, ordering it for a 94 Nissan Quest. Part, part's gonna be the same. So that's that. Hopefully I answered the question. If I didn't, drop a comment and I'll, uh, I'll work on it. I'll work on it some more. We'll go into more depth if we have to. But that's it. So for now, you guys get out and shop and work on your projects. You have a great day, and I will see you in the next video, which should be talking about the piston flip thing.